enjoying the museum so far. Yes. yes. I hope. <laughs> It's not the first museum like this you've been to, Dr. Doodles. No, it hasn't. No. I love my museums. <laughs> and your doodles. And yes, my doodles. What a beautiful desktop. <laughs> that's, that's actually going inside. It's, it's almost a tunnel, if you will. Yeah. You know what that tunnel is, right? The rectum. Yes. <laughs> and it has a beautiful house at the end. <laughs> Lovely metaphor. Ah, there we go. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> Finally, some semblance of sanity. All right. Um, hello, and thank you for having me here at the Butt Museum. I have presented at many a prestigious institution, but I have to say this is a very exciting opportunity for me <laughs> to probe. Uh, this subject matter is, to me, to go boldly where no semiotics professor has gone before. <laughs> yes. My findings, as you will soon see, were fascinating enough. I guess they shed light on the area where the sun don't shine. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I should first clarify that I am a semiotician. Semiotics is the study of... I didn't introduce myself. Where is my second card? Anywho, my name is Dr. Kelsey Ann Bowens. Hello. I, uh, hello, doctor. <laughs> I am the professor of anthropology and ethnology at the University of Bologna with a specialty in semiotics. Now, I should first clarify what semiotics is. It is the study of meaning making, the philosophical theory of signs and symbols. Uh, now, this means I have researched the deeper meanings of symbols their indication, designation, likeness, analogy, metaphor, yada yada. In studying these signs, we can better understand communication. Perhaps um, the patient was trying to communicate something specific by utilizing a key, in particular, as opposed to another object for what we can only assume was sexual pleasure. <laughs> it is important to know the origin of something in order to fully understand it. Given that truth, I will present a brief history, and we would like to call this presentation, Up Yours! <laughs> yes. Up Yours! That is what I said. <laughs> now, uh, like I said, in order to know the origin of something, it's important to know the history. So I'm going to give you a brief history of the lock and key system. <laughs> Alright, um, the earliest signs of lock and key systems were discovered in the ruins of Nineveh in ancient Assyria. These date back to about 704 BC. Now later on, we discovered locks and keys which resembled the ones found in Nineveh uh, in Egypt in the form of a wooden pin lock such as the one you see here in cross section. Ooh. <laughs> now eventually, metal locks and keys became the norm, made of iron or bronze. And in the heyday of the Roman Empire, members of high society locked away their precious tools and valuables in boxes in their homes. The keys to these boxes took shapes like a ring, which was worn on the owner both as security measure and as a symbol of wealth and importance. Now let's fast forward to the Industrial Revolution, the late 18th century, as you all should know, you're all educated. <laughs> Precision engineering led us to the most modern designs we still use today. Around that time, in 1778, a man named Robert Barron invented the lever tumbler lock. It uses a set of levers to prevent the bolt from moving in the lock. Later on, Jeremiah Chubb improved upon the design of the lever tumbler lock, as seen in this illustration in 1818. This led to the making of locks that could only be opened with a key specifically designed to open that particular lock. Later, Joseph Brahma introduced the cylindrical key with precise notches for a precise lock. And after him, Linus Yale Sr. created the most modern design still used today. We know it as the pin tumbler lock. And it had a flat key with serrated edges. It was a developed version of the original Egyptian lock. And that brings us all the way to today. Okay. <laughs> now that we have a clear history of the key, it is important to research what kind of key this patient decided to utilize. The reasons behind the <coughs> use, <laughs> use of a particular kind of key are clarified once we discover what kind of key was used and what that might symbolize. Was it a house key? Was it a car key?
key? <laughs> was it a master key to open every lock? Was it a skeleton key from the days of yore? Well, when I zoomed in to the x-ray of the key, inside the patient, the only proof of the event that we now have, I recognized the overall shape and characteristics of this diagram here, showing a Yale-type cylinder lock key, very similar to a house key. In fact, one can discern on the x-ray image a clear bow, uh, shoulder, some cuts. They're a little blurry, but they're there. <laughs> and the tip. I have concluded in this case that the key which we are studying is, in fact, a house key of some sort. <laughs> Perhaps clarifying the type of key, we can begin to clarify the intention behind the insertion of said key. That's your cue, chickadee. <laughs> Part of my specialty lies in studying the significance of symbols within mythology. I gathered some research in regards to the key throughout Eastern, Western, and ancient mythology. For example, in art, Christian saints, pagan gods, and medieval kings all alike are depicted holding keys as symbols of their spiritual or temporal power. You may recognize the Egyptian Ankh, also known as the Key of Life, the Key of the Nile. It is a hieroglyphic character for life. Gods were portrayed carrying it, signifying eternal life and afterlife. Also, the pagan goddess Sibylle, a Phrygian earth goddess from the area of Asia Minor, ruled all of nature, holds the key to earth which shuts her up in winter and opens her up in spring. Her key opened the gates to the invisible world. I'm not sure what that means. <laughs> in ancient Greece, we often see art representing a key which means knowledge and life. The Roman god Janus, not to be confused with, oh my god, Chan Bing. <laughs> he is a two-faced god of beginnings and transitions. He's the god of doors, gates, endings, time. He has a lot of responsibilities. Often depicted holding a key. He opens the door of the sky and releases the dawn. He closes the old year while opening the new. Janus, January, you get the drift, because it's the first month in the year. <laughs> right. Anyway, emperors, kings, princes, persons of authority gave intricately designed keys known as Chamberlain keys to the officials of ranks below them to symbolize their appointment to higher office. We see this in modern times when a mayor or other higher up presents the key to the city to an esteemed visitor. It is Christian tradition to depict St. Peter with a set of keys in his hand, one gold to open the gates of heaven, and one silver to close the gates of heaven. He is known as the gatekeeper to heaven. <laughs> the two keys represent the power of loosing and binding, an important lesson taught to Peter by Jesus. The keys um, to the... <laughs> now moving on to Judaism, the keys to the synagogue were given to pregnant women going through a difficult labor, um, this symbolized the unlocking of her womb. In Catholicism, back again, <laughs> you often see a depiction of St. Peter repeated, and it inspired the papal seal and flag, a crossed silver and gold key. You will see this image used in the Vatican today as a symbol of papal authority. And if you look to the next slide, my interesting friends. This here is St. Peter. <laughs> Who would have guessed? And he's on stained glass in this depiction holding two gold keys. Gold, yes. And also over here on the right you see Captain Sully holding <laughs> our hero. Holding the key to New York City given to him by the wonderful Bloomberg. And next you'll see the two-faced god, Janus. He has a key and a cock. And that's what the caption said. I've only just done the research. But this shows him having almighty power. Wonderful. Throughout history of human expression, the key has become one of the most regularly seen symbols, although there are hundreds of myths I didn't get to touch on. Uh, I can assure you that even in today's society, and with this particular patient, the key represented something deeper. <laughs> deeper! <laughs> right. And as far as representation 
knows mythology ties closely in with symbolism. In the end, what does a key symbolize in popular culture, history, and our collective psyches? It is often represented as a symbol of wealth, status, or heraldry. If you have a key, it means you have something worth locking up or protecting. If the wife of an affluent man wore keys on her belt, it was to display her importance as one of the heads of household, as we can see here, depicted in this painting of the Duchess of Marlborough. From 1702, you see a small gold key hanging from her waist. Um, keys were also used in coats of armor to show power and status. Of course, it is the old double entendre, innuendo, whatever you want to call it, of the key and phallus and lock and vaginal canal. Let's use our brains here, people. It's not that hard to figure out. Also, another symbol the key holds is power. There's that saying, you have the keys to the kingdom. Uh, those with the most keys have the most power. I tend to think of a groundskeeper, such as Hagrid. <laughs> or, or the janitor from Scrubs. He's a very powerful man, right? Yes. <clears throat> also, while studying the symbolism of the key, I found knowledge, mystery, initiation, and curiosity to be thrown about quite a bit. If you have the keys to knowledge, you can unlock any mystery. You'll never find out what secrets are behind the door if you don't have the key to get past the door, etc. Silver stands for spiritual purity and enlightenment. Gold stands for emotional wealth and well-being. And that kind of ties back into St. Peter having the balance of both. Although we cannot see based on an x-ray, it may be significant if the key used in this experiment was gold or silver. <laughs> <clears throat> Perhaps an obvious solution to this puzzle is that the individual just didn't want to lose their house key. <laughs> Perhaps they were trying to hide it from someone who wanted to take away their power. Perhaps he or she wished to feel closer to God, or quite simply liked the way he felt shoved up their rectum. <clears throat> In light of this, I wish to share a quote. A man who is of sound mind, is one who keeps the inner madman under lock and key. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I truly do believe that this man in the x-ray, or woman, although I have a distinct feeling it was a man, <laughs> only a man would commit such a dumb, dumb act. <laughs> that, ladies and gentlemen, was a quote from Paul Valerie. Oh. Anyway, <laughs> my moment. So, despite my years of study and deep and probing speculations into the matter, I really cannot give you a clear or honest answer. In all my years as a pillar of intellect, I admit I have never reached a conclusion quite like this. I have no fucking clue why someone would stick a key up their ass. Is that the answer you're looking for? Because that's all I got. Goddamn, key up an ass. Fifteen years of education for this. Oh, they want to know why there's a key in his ass. Well, why don't you put two and two together and maybe stick something up your ass while you're there. And oh, what irony is this, that I do not have the key to the answer to understanding this cockamamie scheme? <laughs> I would like to thank the members of the board at the Butt Museum for inviting me here today, <laughs> and my esteemed colleagues for coming out all the way from Bologna, which is in Italy, for <laughs> coming out to support me in my research project. Yes, that's right, ladies and gentlemen. My co-workers from the most esteemed university in Europe are here witnessing this. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs>